Colleagues, great to have you on the show uh, and a welcome to CG Seminar with the magic number of 202. And today we have with us Alison Wheaton, a doctoral student who's going to talk to us about governance in English universities. Before I introduce Alison, let me take you through the web protocols. First webinar is being recorded. Uh, your contributions both in the chat and on camera will be uh, recorded for all time, posted online on the CG website and available on YouTube within 48 hours or so, along with the transcript of the chat function, which we posted on the CG website. Now, please keep yourself muted unless you've been asked to speak or ask you a question. Uh, and you don't need to have your video on. Um, please do so though, when you are brought into the Q&A. We recommend using the speaker's view uh, settings so you can more clearly see who is talking. Now to ask a question of Alison, please type your question out in the chat and I'll select from what's in the chat for the Q&A function. Usually people who raise a question early in the process, that is towards the end of the speaker's presentation or just after that when the Q&A begins, are likely to figure in the Q&A discussion if they want to go on camera. Um, uh, if you come in late, like in the last 10 minutes or so, there's every chance that unfortunately your excellent question or statement will not be included in the discussion. So as I warn every webinar, do come in early with your ideas and with your questions. When you're invited to ask your question in the q and I'll give you a warning before this moment, but when the actual invitation comes um, from me, uh, please unmute yourself, switch on your video and state your name and where you are from. Now, it's a pleasure to introduce Alison Wheaton. Uh, I formerly worked with Alison at, the, at UCL in London, and she is now towards the end of her doctoral studies in the UCL Institute of Education. She's doing her work on the role of English university governing bodies. Previously, she was president of a UK private higher education provider and served on Hefke's uh, leadership governance and Management and Strategic Advisory Committee, and she was a founder member of the UK-wide Standing Committee on Quality Assessment. She's had a uh, lengthy ex executive level career in various businesses before becoming a student. Um, and it's uh, she's one of those people who, like myself, I might say, had a substantial um, activity outside universities, outside research, and then wanted to take our, our reflections and our thoughts from those activities into the process of research and inquiry, and maybe through that to make a contribution to the wider group that we, of people that we were working with before. Um, Alison, uh, the floor is now yours. You'll need to unmute. I'll unmute and share my screen. Good, two for the prize of one. That's showing now, Alison. So you've got uh, uh, there. We go slideshow. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Simon, for inviting me to share my work with you today. This forms, as you said, part of my wider doctoral research into English university governing bodies, and. Um, as I first started to explore my research topic, it became apparent to me that other than a bit of work that had been done regarding gender um, diversity on boards, no one really knew what the governing bodies looked like. And so despite there being quite a lot of publicly available information, this hadn't really been analyzed. So I was curious. Um, this is gonna be a bit of a whistle stop tour because I have quite a lot to cover, but, and I am keen to um, leave time at the end for questions. So. I apologize in advance if some of this is a bit quick. Um, before, we before we get into it though, I just wanted to say a few words about why might this matter? Why does this topic matter? Outside of its, obviously re its obvious relationship to the current debate around uh, diversity characteristics and things. And I think there are just a few points for me to raise. The first is the regulatory regime in England 
reinforces the role of the governing bodies with English university governing bodies obviously responsible for all aspects of governance. There have been trends toward boardism or corporatization or laicization that have been unidentified by previous scholars. Historically, corporate and academic governance was split between councils and senates um, and universities established before 92. However, there have been concerns raised around the failure of shared governance, particularly since the creation of the what were unicameral um, post-92 universities. And compared to European, to its European counterparts, the English universities have been historically seen as having greater autonomy um, and being relatively good practice and engagement with the academic community. So institutionalism is one of the overarching governance theories in my analytical framework for my wider study. And DiMaggio and Powell define the concept of isomorphism, whereby organizations become increasingly similar to each other as actors try to change them. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this concept. They identified three processes which aren't mutually exclusive, coercive, mimetic, and normative. Coercive are pretty self-explanatory. Mimetic tend to result from uncertainty with structural changes most notable, whereas normative um, trend uh, changes tend to happen um, often involving third parties. They also identified predictors of change, and those might include how dependent um, an organization is on others, um, how uncertain, how much uncertainty there is, um, and, and really what the dynamics are at sector level. HE scholars have done quite a lot of work regarding institutional isomorphism, including today's host. Um, here I provide an overview, though there are no doubt some gaps for which I apologize. Studies often state, note that states attempt to diversify provision usually result in greater homogeneity and sometimes stratification. To date, research regarding isomorphism in HE is largely overlooked governing bodies. So with that by way of background, here are my research questions. Can one identify any isomorphic influences on English governing body composition? Today's discussion is limited to composition. In my wider work, I also look at governing body roles. And if so, what are the consequences? I've combined a thematic review of sector level documentary evidence with empirical data regarding changes to composition over time. Governance is multi-level and with multiple actors. For this research, I identified national and sector level sources involving this wide range of actors. I should note that the Privy Council doesn't provide any sector level documents per se. They're included here as an actor because they approve any changes to institutional governing documents proposed by autonomous governing bodies. For these purposes, I considered institutional level data, including governing body composition, as in effect a dependent variable. So that data which I have aggregated, um, I used to see the potential impact of these isomorphic pressures. Here is a timeline of the document entry evidence included in my research. There are 17 in total, which span 35 years. By coincidence, most of the documents with direct references to governing body composition are on the top half of this slide with the exception of the first and last below the line. The Education Reform Act of 1988, which was a precursor to the creation of the 1992 universities, sorry, the post-1992 universities, and the Committee of University Chair's latest governance code. It's noteworthy that throughout these documents, there are multiple references to institutional autonomy and the need to maintain and or encourage diversity of provision and practices. Whilst I have focused on pressures and not processes, as the latter is harder to detect in documentary analysis, the straight line is, is deceptive as these pressures interrelate. And I just want to use one example, a fairly recent example of how these um, might work. And that is the new English regulatory regime as of 2018. The English regulatory regime requires governing bodies to self-reflect and report on governance arrangements. That's the sort of stated requirement. However, other than some lists of what might be considered as evidence of compliance or non-compliance with registration requirements, there is very little guidance. Further, institutions are now actively discouraged from seeking any advice from the OFS, which is increasing uncertainty. 
sector bodies, including the Committee of University Chairs, develop guidance, not always entirely consistent with the latest regulatory advice, partly because they need to satisfy their members, and then other professionals conduct effectiveness reviews to fairly standard templates. So all these three isomorphic elements are at play. I detected pressures relating to governing body composition in these six areas. They include size, mix of member types, types of internal and external members. I've included tenure, which might appear to be more of a practice issue than a composition issue. However, um, a lack of a term limit can limit the amount of member renewal. So that's why I've included it here. The upshot is the documents reveal for all uni English universities apart from Oxford and Cambridge, a desire for governing bodies which are smaller in number, 20, uh, smaller than 25 in number, a lay majority with a mix of skills and experience, academic and professional staff members plus student rep members, although these are not meant to be representative in a representative capacity. And from the original higher education corporations, the precursors to the post 92s, if there are any additional co-opted members, one must be an external educator. And what I've shown here is how many documents have explicit references. So for example, there are nine documents with explicit references to governing body size, um, eight with regard to internal member types and so on. There are in some instances, multiple references. Um, it was the CUC's latest um, guide that notes the desirability of a senior independent governor. I footnoted um, Scotland in terms of um, governing uh, lay member characteristics because under the Scotland's Gender Representation on Public Boards Act of 2018, um, there's a requirement for 50% female um, representation of non-executives. So what might be the consequences here? Um, so moving away from the documentary evidence to what's been happening in parallel. As part of my wider research, I collected and analyzed governing body composition data from 120 English universities, which were previously funded by the Funding Council, as they had to provide more data with regard to governing body features. I have a total of just over 2,200 governors in my database. I was able to capture governing body size, structure in terms of member types, and I also captured lay member characteristics such as gender, academic and professional qualifications, employment status, and both executive and non-executive sector experience. So I had all this data, but I needed something to which to compare it to. I eventually identified three potential sources. I was familiar with the first two of these. Baston's 1990 study of governing bodies of the higher education corporations, which as I mentioned, were the precursors to the post-92s, and the 1996 study of 24 English uh, UK university governing bodies. Um, that study inspired other aspects of my research, but it also provided more data with regard to lay member characteristics, but obviously across a smaller sample. Thankfully, I discovered as part of my research a 2004 study published by CUC, which provided a much wider sample. And we're going to look at each of these briefly in turn. As noted here, Baston's study included 51, the 51 higher education corporations created by the Education Reform Act of 1988. Of these, all 24 of the former polytechnics are now universities. 18 of the former colleges formed 17 universities. The study provided an abundance of data for this population of 41 universities, which still exist today. So what I've done is I've taken that data and I've compared it to my database as of spring 2019. And I apologize because a couple of these slides get pretty busy. But on the left side of this slide, it shows totals. And on the right side, it shows lay member statistics. One might expect post-92 governing bodies looked fairly similar as they were established by the same act. In fact, the size ranged from 13 to 25 in 1990 in terms of total membership. In 1990, there were 20 members on average with a mode of 25. 
Now, as of 2019, they're just under 18 members with a much lower mode of 17. Within this, lay membership is, has increased slightly. It's not obvious here, but I have the underlying data. And what it shows me is that of, there were 25 universities which started with 20 or more members. So of these 41 HECs. And of those, of those 25, there's only one that decreased in size, sorry, which increased in size. And that was Manchester Met. All the others um, significantly, de some of them significantly decreased in size. Of those that have, were fewer than 20 members, there were 16, um, only seven are larger. So the original 41 HECs only eight have increased the size of their boards, which is why the mode has come down by so much. Uh, my data also reveals, although I don't have the data on this slide, that the diversity of the lay membership has increased with twice as many women from 20% to 40% and a smaller majority from industry. The second study I mentioned was, um, I think Peter's on, might be on the webinar today, but um, the 1996 study looked at a little, lot more detail um, about governing body member characteristics, which was great. Um, but overall, they found that the, that the pre and post 92s were, I think, more similar than they expected or than they anticipated. They found the majority of lay members were white male aged between 46 and 65 and full time professionals with I think it was just over 20% in full retirement. 18% were female and less than 2% were ethnic minorities. So how could I, how could I um, sort of consider um, that with regard to my study? The other source of data I found as a baseline, because this is tricky because there isn't really good historic data, is um, fortunately someone at the CUC had retained a copy of a report they had issued in 2004 based on a study they sponsored specifically in response to the Deering Report of 1996. The scope was wide-ranging wide and included compositional elements. Unfortunately, none of the researchers retained the underlying data, so I wasn't able to do a similar exactly like-for-like -like comparison. I did know that 79 of the 114 UK universities participated and that it excluded Oxford and Cambridge, and I also knew the split between pre- and post-92s. I compared these 79 UK universities with 83 English universities, which were established by 2003, which included Canterbury, Christchurch, and Gloucestershire as the only new universities founded after the original post 92s. And this one does have a lot of numbers, but I'll draw your attention. Um, I'm afraid I flip, flipped the axis on this. So the rows are pre 92s, post 92s, and totals. And the columns um, show the 2003 data and then the current more recent data. The upshot is the overall size of the governing bodies has decreased from 28 members to 19 members, with the range shrinking from 17 to 72, which is quite a big range, to 13 to 25. Unsurprisingly, the biggest shift was in the pre-92s because they had the bigger range to begin with. The total membership shrank by more than 50% to 20 members, so from 32 to 20 members, with a smaller number but higher proportion of lay members. And this is obviously in keeping with um, Mike and Aniko's work around um, governing bodies of last that was published last year. The variation in post 92s is consistent with the earlier findings compared to Bastion. There's been a fair bit of change of structures, particularly overall size taking place. The 2003 data on gender was collected and presented somewhat diplomatically, providing no averages, for example. However, this shows that the vast majority of universities had between 20 and 40% female lay membership with the pre-92s lagging behind the post-92s. Almost 30% of the universities had fewer than one in five female members. Now, the data indicates the pre-92s have actually slightly overtaken the post-92s on gender diversity, 
even without including any Scottish universities in the 2019 data, because they might be even higher given the legislation. I just wanted to touch on some other diversity characteristics for a moment. Um, when I did my data collection in 2019, which was actually the second wave of data I collected, I was assured that the statistics agency was about to make reporting of governing body diversity data mandatory. It had been voluntary for a few years. So I did not attempt to collect such data in my updated database. Here's the UK data from HESA based on the 2018, 2019 staff returns. It indicates what looks like encouraging increases in ethnic diversity. However, based on my 2017 attempt to collect ethnicity, I am sure that the vast majority of the ethnic diversity relates to the student membership, and in some instances, staff. The ethnic diversity of lay members remains very low. The reporting is patchy, with 16 universities missing ethnicity data on more than 30% of its governors. Further, the data cannot be disaggregated by member type, um, and the institutional data is only available um, by mission group, not by any sort of other um, marker. So before wrapping up, I just wanted to br briefly share some of the other insights I gathered with regard to lay member characteristics. And here I've illustrated those first with four chairs and then subsequently for other lay members. As of early 2019, 25% of the chairs were female, 51% of the deputies were female. I created six sector clusters, corporate, civil service, public service, professional, which includes lawyers and accountants, academia, and other charitable organizations. I also clustered universities by nature of foundation, the civics, the earlies, which include Durham, University of London, and Imperial, 1960s, and so on. Chairs come from a wider range of sectors than they did before, with less than 50% from a corporate background. 22% evenly split between civil and public servants and so forth. So 14% professional, 9% academic, and six from non-for-profit. Backgrounds um, vary by type of institution as shown here. So if you're a civic and early or a former polytechnic, you're more likely to have a chair who has a corporate background, whereas the 1960s universities are significantly more likely to have a former civil servant as chair. Uh, you'd expect the cathedral universities are dominated by religious public sector service and educational background, um, and the specialists have more professional and academic chairs. I also did some work around career stage of the, the lay membership. Um, somewhat surprisingly, given the time commitments, 33% of the chairs are still active executives. This is lowest in the civics and highest in the specialist universities. There is a bit of a bell curve with regard to um, career stage of lay members. And what it shows is that um, as much as 15% of the membership are now in their, this is their first um, non-executive role. And interestingly, that's consistent with the level of retirees. The, um, with regard to other lake member characteristics, here the numbers of females are higher. Um, the sector, backgrounds are fairly similar to the chairs, except they're more professionals, which will probably explain by the need to have a um, qualified chair or ideally have a qualified chair for the audit committee. Um, and they're more with education and academic backgrounds. I also um, looked at lay academics and here I did not include honorary professorships. Um, so I found that there's 69 lay academics in total, five of those are chairs, four are deputies. There's very uneven distribution by type. There are fewer in civics and former polytechnics and a lot more in the new universities. This may have to do with um, a need or a desire to be more support for the executive team and or um, to signal legitimacy. Um, and 45% of the 120 universities had any lay academics at all. I also had a look at alumni. Simon had, I think, looked in some of his research previously about alumni membership on boards. Um, I found that there are 154 in total, and that's out of the whole 2,200. 
Um, there's six are chairs, nine are deputies. And again, it's unevenly distributed. Not surprisingly, civics in the, the 1960s universities have significantly more. So, so what are the answers to my original questions? Yes, I think isomorphic influences regarding English university governing body composition can be detected in the documentary evidence. The areas which I've said here have coincided with greater homogeneity include smaller governing bodies, a lay majority with somewhat more diverse characteristics, and more consistent staff and student membership. I do have that data um, if anyone's interested. Greater homogeneity in governing body composition can be detected for the post-92 universities since 1990 and for all English universities since 2003. And I suggest this isn't entirely coincidental. At a higher level, English university governing bodies are no longer, you could argue, are no longer unwieldy. They're not as male nor stale, but they're still pretty pale. And although lay membership um, does now indicate greater sector diversity. And just to finish, a few thoughts on further points to consider. A few areas um, that I think are worth investigating. The first one is, are, governing, are smaller governing bodies any more effective? Um, I think now there could be plenty of case studies to look at those which have altered, um, sometimes decreased and then changed back um, their governing body composition. And from my other research, it's clear to me that that needs to be considered in relationship to committee structures and other ways of working. I myself am considering governing body composition in the context of governing body roles, which is my second area I think should be explored. And I'm also curious what, if any, pressures might result in further reshaping of governing body composition. It might be more student members, more lay, mem lay academic members or others. And then finally, I would suggest the sector might like to sort itself out in the spirit of self-reflective governance with regard to the capture and reporting of data regarding governing body characteristics. I thank you for your attention and I'm delighted to take any questions. Well, thank you, Alison, for that most systematic um, explanation of the composition of governing bodies. Uh, I've got a question about isomorphism. Um, I, I, I'm a skeptic about institutional theory. I think that, you know, it, it doesn't capture the, cap the capacity for innovation, the, the, real, the really paradigm shifting kind of innovation. I think of Singapore's strategy in the global higher education environment. I mean, isomorphism would have said that won't happen, that can't happen. But Singapore did this something completely new, the, the global schoolhouse and attracted enormous um, attention and, 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 and network relationships and built you know, a great global role over time. So it did something completely new. But isomorphism as a notion of behavior of organizations does seem to fit when you've got a sort of structured situation where a single field and a single set of rules which, which govern things and so on. So my question for you is what scope would there, is there, what scope is there for governing bodies to be different from what has occurred? You know, what, do you detect a sense in which they've made, in composing their governing bodies, institutions have made safe choices? Could they have done something different? How different could they have done it? Yeah, I, um, I totally take your point about institutional theory being sort of insufficient um, to, and as a result, it's, on, it's one of many um, underlying governance theories that I've included in my wider research um, in my wider study. I think with regard to um, practices or in, a, in effect, part of what's going on here with the English universities is I think that there are institutions that can be seen as having been innovative. So I think you can find examples where people have come in and said, we're gonna try something different um, and here are our reasons. I think um, as I sort of described in some of those, my description of the new regulatory regime, I think that um, institutions are to some extent understandably risk averse in this new regime because things are a lot less clearly sort of set out. And I think they feel the feedback I'm getting 
is they feel quite isolated. So um, there's a great deal of interest in what everyone else is doing, but they feel somehow that they don't have a good sense. And this is where these um, sort of third parties are coming in because it's the third parties who are helping provide an overview um, to, and the third parties could be the sector bodies, it could be other professional organizations, um, because a lot of the governors are seeking insight and information about what other people are doing. And a lot of what they're interested in is what works. And so that's partly why I posited my first area to for further exploration, which is, well, what is working, you know, and, and under what circumstances. And I think that that there is a definite um, uh, demand requirement, whatever you want to call it, it would be a beneficial area of further research. Mm. Thank you, Alison. Uh, I'd like to bring in Peter Scott for the first substantive question. Peter. Uh, thank you, Simon, and thank you, Alison. I thought that was very interesting. Lots of very interesting data there. I'm glad you concluded that things seem to be getting slightly better, um, uh, although the pace seems fairly glacial, I'd say, in terms of representing the university community as a whole. The question I wanted to ask was actually about selection of this composition, this, the stage that pre that comes before, of course, is how are these people selected? Um, and I guess one of the problems is that uh, largely, and I'm not talking about the staff and student members so much, I'm talking about the kind of lay members, the independent members, they sort of select themselves. I mean, through a nominations committee, um, typically, I guess, the chair, the vice chair, the chairs of the major committees, and perhaps one or two others, uh, and then agreed by the uh, whole uh, council or board. Um, uh, also, I think with usually quite a lot of advice from the vice chancellor um, uh, and the senior management, they have quite a major input into that um, often. Um, and I think there are two problematical features about that. First of all, if the people who already uh, compose governing bodies, that, that kind of demographic actually selects new people, although they, I think they struggle on the whole really hard to try and find different kinds of people through advertising and so on, um, uh, there's, there's always going to be a regression back to the norm, which is sort of people like us, people we know. Um, so that's one problematical feature. And the other problematical feature is that I think probably there's a bit too much influence by the senior management, by the vice chancellor. After all, a board is meant to, in a sense, be scrutinizing the performance of the vice chancellor. And if the vice chancellor, in a sense, has a lot of influence over who actually becomes members of the board, um, and that raises other issues about sometimes a rather collusive relationship between the chair and the vice chancellor, which excludes other governing bodies. So I think there are lots of issues in relation to the selection of governors, as well as the composition and, of course, the role, um, which you're obviously going to touch on in, yeah. in the next part of your research. Thank you for your question, um, Peter. I, um, as part of my wider research, I've conducted over 60 interviews across five university case studies. And I realized they're not, um, they, they weren't meant to be a representative sample, but they are a good cross section. It's three pre 92s, including one Russell group and two post 92s. And what I found, I, to be frank, inspired by some of your research from the 90s, um, I explored lay member uh, motivation to join and the, more the specifics of how they came to join. And interestingly, what I found is across the 60 plus uh, members, about half of them were, as you described, simply asked to join. Um, many of those not having really any kind of, well, two thirds of those not having any kind of formal interview process. Um, and ha half of those have actually applied. So I think practices are beginning to shift around, I'm not saying it's universal, but I think practices are beginning to shift. And I think one of the reasons they're beginning to shift is the, your point about people like us. Universities are struggling to meet any sorts of potential um, aspirations around age, um, gender, and any other diversity characteristics if they kept doing what they were doing in terms of finding new members. So, and what I found, which I thought was really interesting, is if you look at those um, who applied, who, who, who positively sought out um, 
the positions, they were much more likely to be women and they were much more likely to be ethnic minorities. So that shift um, appears to be, and okay, this is over a relatively small sample, but it's still, um, you know, I think it's still a significant indication. Your later, your um, additional point around kind of influence by the vice chancellor. That's an interesting one as well, because um, I've noticed that there's a much greater focus on the, within the nominations committee um, around some of the kind of good practice questions and an, an increase in a shift away from just calling it nominations and actually calling it governance. And so um, they seem to be taking more ownership for the idea of what good governance looks like. And that seems, I think, and um, the other thing I can um, maybe reassure you or not is of my, um, uh, as part of my research, I identified influences on governing bodies' perceptions of their roles and sector level scandals is definitely one of those influences, external influences. And as a result, um, people speak, especially the lay members, they speak quite a lot about the idea of needing to work closely with the executive, but not too closely. So. Thanks, Alison. And the questions are starting to come in. I'm going to ask you one first and then pass to our call list. Um, students, you mentioned students towards the end, uh, the potential for bringing students into a larger role in governing bodies. Have you seen in your research, which will take in not, not only what you presented today, but the whole body of it, any institution which is handling students' involvement particularly well? Are there cases where that you saw where it was done well and what were the conditions and what were the, the factors which made it happen well, if that is the case? Yep. Um, thanks, Simon. I would um, make a couple observations there. One is um, it might not be happening everywhere, but I've come across some instances where they're going, they're increasing the number of students on the governing body. So whereas it used to be there might be one, uh, maybe two at the most, um, the overall number is, is definitely increasing. And I've come across um, some institutions who are actually in the process of adding a third um, student governor to their, to their overall governing body. I think the, the other observation I would make is I think it's those institutions, at least in the work I've done so far, where they're looking beyond the student union representatives as representative of the student experience. So, so there's still there's some wonderful examples of really close working through the student union um, or with the student union. But I think that increasingly, and um, I would argue this is part of the shift in focus with the Office for Students, named as it is, um, where the governing bodies are definitely taking a greater, more direct interest in the student experience. And as, as such, um, and, and, th and they're looking beyond the NSS, they're looking beyond um, the sort of more traditional, I suppose, student union activities and thinking more broadly about the student, who the students are and, um, and how they, as governors, get a better feel for the student experience. And as a result, they're creating different ways to interact with the student body. Thank you, Alison. Uh, Chris Ellison is our next questioner. Chris. Hello. Thanks for a really interesting presentation, Alison. Um, you sort of touched on this in one of the previous answers, but I was wondering how many of the university governing bodies are, are looking to improve um, the diversity of their members and what kind of things they've been doing to, to support that? Yeah, um, thanks for your question, Chris. It's a, it's a really tricky one um, because my research um, in terms of my more qualitative research is really limited to my five um, case studies. And those are, um, you know, as I said before, aren't necessarily entirely representative. I would um, actually go back to something that I remember from my early involvement with HEFKE, 
in terms of the strategic advisory committee around leadership governance and management. And I have to say, I think there's a real, how to put it, um, my sense has always been a perception that we don't have a problem. So it's the, the general perception is, um, it's not, we don't really have a problem with diversity, whether it's gender diversity, ethnic diversity. And, and I, saw it, um, I saw it in the mid, you know, in 2013, 14. So I think there's been a fair degree of denial um, and it's also borne out by some research that was conducted by the Leadership Foundation, where um, governors were asked about, um, you know, their perceptions. And this is the thing about a lot of what gets, a lot of the work that gets done around governing body effectiveness is a lot of self-reporting. And so you get a lot of um, this kind of reinforcing, we're okay, aren't we? And then the people who come in to facilitate things aren't necessarily pushing the boat out as it were. So uh, I think it's variable. Um, although I must say, don't get me wrong, there are definitely some institutions. Um, and to be frank, you can kind of look at the underlying statistics around say gender diversity. There are a couple of reports that have been done by Norma Gerbeau. And if you look at those that have made the biggest shifts, I would argue they're doing that on purpose. So there are institutions which are, are actively engaged in this. Thank you. Good. Thanks, Chris. And thanks, Alison. Uh, John Enke is next. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Alison, for a very uh, uh, interesting and informative presentation. As you're aware, um, the English Polytechnics were under the control of the Local Education Authority or Municipal Council to use uh, perhaps more international language. Um, this created tensions uh, between the municipal authorities and the leadership of Polytechnics sometimes. Um, given that that's now gone, do you have any data on the origins by geography or community of governors? Um, you referred to alumni who are sort of special case in a way, aren't they? But um, do you have any data on the origins of other governors? Yeah, it's a really, really good question. And I was really um, tempted to try to do some work in that with that regard. However, in terms of what was publicly available, because a lot of my, I decided to prioritize um, to use as much publicly available information as I could for the quantitative aspects of my research and leave myself more time and um, attention for more of the case study and qualitative work. Um, so I don't have that. But again, I think that would be a really interesting, um, I assume quite straightforward um, piece of data that could be collected by HESA um, in their staff, uh, in their, their usual staff reporting. So I think some sort of home postcode would be a mighty fine question. Um, I mean, sometimes you get the dynamic where someone might not live nearby, but they work nearby. And I suppose that's another consideration but um, no, I, I agree with you. It is, it's definitely something that's come up in my case study work um, where I have some institutions that have some very different profiles with regard to um, the, the, the home um, base of the governors. But I've been, I've been trying to encourage um, advanced HE as they now are to, to be frank, poke and prod HESA a bit in terms of their data collection. Um, and I think it's used as a really good suggestion and I'll pick it up, I'll add it to my list. Thank you. Thanks for your contribution to the research, John. Uh, and thank you, Alison. Uh, Ian McNay is next, Ian. Hello, Alison. <laughs> thank you for the presentation. Um, it links, I suppose, to the diversity issue, um, but you raised the question about how effective are they? Uh, so two questions. One, what criteria for effectiveness uh, Deering, of course, recommended that the governing body should review either themselves or the university and its relations with constituencies. When I did my work at Greenwich, nobody knew what the constituencies were or how they were communicated with. But let me link that then to the diversity issue. Uh, have you any data which suggests, if you've done anything on effectiveness, that the more diverse governing bodies are more effective? Or is that more an issue of size or other factors? Yeah, thanks for your question, Ian. Um, that's the that's the that's the money question, isn't it? 
Um, Sorry, Simon, I can't pay you. <laughs> Simon talked me out of out of out of research and governing body effectiveness about four years ago, because it's a, because it's an unanswerable question. Um, now I. I I completely take your point about um, the perils of trying to judge what criteria with regard to effectiveness. I suppose I'd make a couple observations. Um, and some of this comes out of the work that's been done in the US. And I think the first question around effectiveness is, does one judge effectiveness on how well the board works or the council works as a council? Or does one try to judge effectiveness based on how well the board or council um, influences the outcomes of the institution and the performance of the institution. And you mentioned um, two aspects about what came out of Deering. One was with regard to that governing body should be reviewed, the effectiveness or the sort of performance of governing body should be reviewed. And that was always expressed in the context of institutional performance. So somewhere that that link was broken. And I think, and it's something I'm picking up in my further research because um, there is no longer any mention of considering governing body effectiveness in the, in the context of institutional performance. That link has been broken. I personally think part of the reason it's been broken is the shift towards external metrics. Um, so be it TEF, REF, NSS, whatever it might be. But I think somehow the governing bodies have kind of ducked and dodged the responsibility for kind of owning or sponsoring institutional performance would be one thought. Um, your point about constituencies, I think, is a really important one as well. I decided as part of my um, wider research to ask governors who they thought the governing body stakeholders are. And I specifically said state governing body as opposed to university because they might be different. And I wanted to, to think a bit more personally about the question. Um, so I have unveiled or revealed my research will um, shed some light on at least who the governors perceive as their um, constituencies. And interestingly, one of my five university case studies has actually undertaken an external perceptions audit. Um, with their wider stakeholders. So there are some sort of changes going on um, on both those topics. But thank you for your question. I look forward to hearing more. Yeah, and thanks, Anne. Uh, and thanks again, Alison. Uh, Hong Wei is next, Hong Wei Gu. Uh, thank you, Alison, for this insightful talk. And I'm eager to look forward to the completion of your research. My question is, how does um, isomorphic influences on English university governing bodies alter deeply ingrained perceptions and, and behaviors? Thank you. Um, well, I think, although I take Simon's earlier point about institutionalism potentially feeling like it's maybe somewhat stagnating and that it does not promote innovation, um, I would actually suggest, certainly through some of the work that I'm doing, these findings that I'm having, is that practices from other sectors um, are finding their way into um, the higher education governance arena, at least at, at sort of governing body level. And that's coming through the members themselves. So one of the, um, a lot of the research has been done historically around governance or governing body roles. Um, they identified sort of institutional influences and environmental influences. And one of the influences I've added to that kind of paradigm is individual influences. And I think part of what's happening is by the time you become a governor on a university governing body, you probably have a fair bit of experience or certainly relative, uh, relevant perspective on things. And with that, you are bringing your own personal experience of other sectors and your own diversity characteristics. And so it may be a bit slow, um, and, but I think it's happening. And I think the other observation I would like to make is Although there's a lot of talk about boardism and corporatization in university governing bodies, I think 
um, something that's maybe overlooked is the influence of those who come from sectors outside of corporate. So civil service, public service, um, non-for-profits, even academia. I think that those individuals, um, some of the most interesting conversations I had in my research around perceptions of how governing bodies work um, were with individuals who have not corporate experience, because sometimes for corporate people, the shift is too great. The cultural shock is just too enormous. But for people who come from local government or the fire service or the Ministry of Defense, they can see a lot of parallels with where, or the health service, they can see a lot of parallels with where they were 10 or 15, 20 years ago and where they see higher education today. And I think that it's going to be through those channels that there might be um, even greater sort of sources of change and innovation. Thanks for that uh, thoughtful answer, Alison. And thank you, Hongwei, for maintaining your very impressive record of asking a question in every webinar that I can, re I can remember. Our other regular questioner hasn't come in today, but you, you certainly have, so well done. Uh, next, uh, Aki Yanazawa. Aki, welcome to the webinar. Thank you, uh, Simon, and thank you, Alison. Uh, uh, thank you very much for a very interesting and uh, stimulating discussion today. So that my question is, uh, I would like to ask there, uh, if there are some distinctive, distinctive characteristics in composition of the university bodies among universities with, for example, female vice chancellors. So my yeah. point is that, uh, the, as uh, Professor Peter Scott already mentioned that, I suppose there are some relationship between uh, the characteristics of the university leaders mm -hmm. and uh, the composition of the university governance. And, uh, and uh, many uh, universities uh, or the higher education system like Japan are now struggling to diversify the university leaders. So I'd like to give some uh, suggestion from you. Yeah, yeah, no, I take, I take your point. Um, as part of, thank you for your question. As part of my research, um, the vice chancellors um, sit on the governing body of all but um, three of the 120 universities in my research. And of those 117 vice chancellors, 25% are women. So um, it's a similar, it's the same percentage as um, chairs. I don't have, um, I don't have wider, there, there is um, work has been done, it's called Women Count, I think, um, by Norma Gerbeau in 2016 and 2018, looking at gender diversity of uh, leadership teams. I think it extends to leadership teams, but it definitely has um, the vice chancellors and I think the sort of senior executive groups counted in there. So it's worth having a look at that. Um, one thing I did, because I was curious because of my corporate background, um, the whole question of gender diversity on boards has obviously been going on for some time. Um, one of the things I did is I looked at if there was a female chair at a university, was there any greater um, diversity on the council? And I don't have a lot of data points, so it's hard to sort of look at trends, but I actually found that there was less gender diversity. Um, if there was a female chair, um, and it could be coincidence because it could just be a timing issue of when recruitment happens and things, but if there's a female chair, there's even less fewer incidents of female vice chancellors. Um, and there are fewer overall um, female lay members. Now, this obviously would benefit from time series analysis, which is why the data capture at sector level would be really helpful. Um, and also, um, yeah, there could be other, other factors coming into it. But um, no, I think this, I think that's an area, I mean, you have to be careful in just having data for data's sake, but I do think that just the underlying statistics um, would be helpful. So then people can actually take the time not to try to collate the data, but actually analyze the data and understand and, and, and study more of the underlying causal factors. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Thank, thank you, Aki, and thank you, Alison. Uh, Lauren Boltz is our next questioner. Lauren. Thanks. Um, so I'm Lauren. I'm from the US, but I'm actually in the UK working as a, a student representative of the student union. Uh, so I wanted to go back to the, what you originally talked about with student representation. And I wanted to ask what you see as the future or ideal form of student representation in governing bodies and kind of student unions role in that. Um, thanks for your question, Lauren. And again, I wish I had a sort of magic wand or a wonderful all inclusive answer to that. Um, it is actually why I've flagged that I, as part of my research, um, what I've found is so far is the student roles. I think one of the difficulties um, with both student and staff roles on governing bodies is that in the nicest possible way, they're not meant to be representative. And so there's this whole question of how much are you representing a particular interest and how much are you taking collective responsibility? So, um, so I think that now interesting, the, the way it's portrayed um, by most of the members of council that I've spoken with is they feel that the student piece of that works more effectively because um, the students in a weird way are in one way, they feel a little more removed from the governing body. And this is with this is in comparison to say staff. So people are pretty universal um, in the feeling that the staff governor role is the most thankless task around. Um, and that the student governor roles are becoming more meaningful um, in the new regulatory regime with this greater focus on, on student welfare, student outcomes, um, and, and please don't take my comments about people wanting to move beyond the student representation um, in terms of understanding the student experience as, as any sort of criticism of that. I think it's an and. So I don't think it's an or, I think it's an and. And I think um, it's a more, um, comprehensive and cohesive. So I suppose one role that the students could play, student reps, is helping the institution or the governing body think about how does it get the best full view. So for example, one issue that was raised by one of the chairs of my um, one of my cases was that she's not comfortable how well she really understands part-time student experience versus international student experience versus um, mature student experience. And so, so I think it's an and, you know, I think it's how can the, the, the student union um, and the representatives who already have a seat around the council table, how can they help add to that understanding of the wider student body? Thanks, Alison. And thanks, Lauren. Good, good to hear from you. I've got one more question, a kind of closing question, Alison. It's about, about the pandemic and governing bodies. And here again, I'm, I'm treating you as an expert rather than just someone who's done a particular body of research on a particular topic. Uh, but you, you, know, you do now know a lot about governing bodies. So this may be a, a reasonable question to ask, even though you haven't been researching it directly. Um, now, have the roles and responsibilities of governing bodies been affected in the COVID-19 period? Uh, have their, uh, the, the rhythms and nature of their meetings changed? Um, have their relationships with the university community or with the executive changed in any way you can discern? Yeah, I think um, my sort of short answer would be it varies. Um, I think that in, I think the shift to online um, has meant that there's probably more meetings at the moment. So I think there's a greater frequency of people getting together um, because they don't all have to travel depending on the answer to the earlier question of where are they based in the first place. Um, but there's a definite sense of sort of uh, immediacy and accessibility that's facilitated online. There are some concerns about that though because they're worried about the relationship aspects, particularly with new governors coming on board um, that that those will be difficult to build and it's similar to any environment that you know is dealing with these issues. Um, some 
feel, some governors feel, um, how to put it? I think it's heightening a sense of wanting to be able to make a meaningful contribution. Mm. So I think that um, whereas in the normal course of business or normal course of activities, there's an underlying current of that I would generally, you know, generally observe. I think though it's, that's now heightened. And so people really feel like I really want to try to make a contribution. And in some ways it might be almost highlighting the fact that some institutions, it's hard for them to do that. Um, and so, so I think it will be, I think it's a really interesting question. Um, and I think that it is something again that would warrant, very usefully warrant further study um, as so many areas will after the, as well, I won't say after we get through this, as we get through this. Mm, it's certainly taking its time. I mean, the larger question, I suppose, is, you know, as a university executive and leadership and how that's changed and how university, com you know, communities as communities have changed and not least because of, uh, you know, everything going online, but, but, but also more generally about the way in which major problems and challenges are, are handled, the way in which the relationship between universities and, and students has, has, has evolved in this period. Now, students is going to be our next topic in the webinar program, and we've come up again uh, today a couple of times. Our next presenters will be really Rafa and Yanya Komoljenovic, and they'll be talking about from a rebel to consumer and now a digital user, the changing role of students in British university governance. So there you are, Alison. Uh, we'll have more, more governance, uh, and uh, hopefully you'll be there and taking part in the Q&A this time. Uh, and it will be students as the focus. So we look forward to seeing everyone next time. But meanwhile, let's say thanks very sincerely to Alison for a really useful and interesting presentation. And we look forward to bringing you back when the, when the, uh, the PhD is finally put to bed. Thank thanks, Alison, and thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye for now. Bye. Thank you.